Hello, today we are going to derive the Rayleigh criterion. When light passes through an aperture such as the pupil of the eye, diffraction causes the light to spread out and we are unable to resolve different points in the image of a scene if the angular separation is smaller than a particular multiple of the ratio of the wavelength of the light to the diameter of the aperture. For instance, if two stars have an angular separation smaller than a particular value, then we cannot observe them as separate points of light. We still see the starlight, it does not disappear, but we are unable to resolve the image into two distinct stars. We start by writing down the electric field. Electric field is the wave equation. Similarly, the magnetic field, the magnetic induction actually. If we're going through a uniform material, then the electric displacement and the magnetic field also obey the wave equation. Here the speed of light is c. Now let a be an arbitrary constant vector. So I'm going to dot this equation with a let psi be a dot e, then we get del squared psi minus 1 over c squared d2 psi by dt squared is 0. Now we want to consider monochromatic waves, chromatic waves. So they have a well-defined frequency. Let's just write psi of x and t as little psi of x e to the minus i k c t, and then k be two pi Actually, it's just k is 2 pi over lambda, where lambda is the wavelength of the light. Substitute this form into here, and we get del squared little psi plus k squared little psi is 0, and that's known as the Helmholtz equation. Now we want to impose some boundary conditions. Boundary conditions are going to be that psi of x should be order 1 over r, where r is the modulus of x, and d psi by dr is i k plus little o1 of psi as r goes to infinity. These conditions imply that we have an outgoing wave. Now we're not considering the ingoing wave. Well, del squared in spherical polars is 1 over r d2 by dr squared r psi plus k squared psi equals 0 if psi is just a function of the radial coordinate. So we're looking for radially symmetric solutions. Multiply 3 by r, and you can see that r psi be equal to e to the i k r or e to the minus i k r. So in particular we're going to take psi to be equal to e to the i k r over r and minus 1 over 4 pi in there. And we'll see where that comes from in a second. Notice that this obeys these boundary conditions. In particular if you look at d psi by dr Whatever that's, that's just the logarithmic derivative, which will give me i k, and then we get a minus plus, no, it was a minus, minus 1 over r. So that's what we want. The other solution here would not satisfy the boundary conditions. This is why we impose this boundary condition to pick out what is going to be the outgoing wave. 
to show this wave is outgoing, if we put back the dependence on time, so psi of x and t, then is minus 1 over 4 pi r e to the i k r minus c t. And because that bit is some function of r minus c t, that means it's outgoing. If you imagine f to be shot and peaked at the origin, then as t increases, you need r to increase as well to get the sharp peak. So it moves outwards and it decreases in magnitude like 1 over r. Now let's... Okay, this equation here, we have here, only works for r not equal to 0. For r equal to 0, things can go wrong. So now let's have a look at the integral over a ball of radius of sine about the origin of del squared psi plus k squared psi d3x. Of course, this thing we were solving equal to zero. But we can see that's going to be the integral over the boundary the ball of radius epsilon of grad psi dot s plus k squared the integral of psi dv by the divergence theorem. Well, psi was proportional to 1 over r in magnitude. That volume is proportional to epsilon cubed. So that whole thing is big O epsilon squared. ds is just going to be in the direction of r hat, so we just get this thing, and that's 4 pi epsilon squared for the area of the sphere times this quantity here, which was i k minus 1 over 4 pi epsilon plus 1 over 4 pi epsilon squared. And you can see that thing tends to 1 as epsilon goes to 0. So therefore, del squared psi plus k squared psi was actually equal to delta cubed x. So this corresponds to a point light source, or the Green's function, for the Helmholtz equation. OK. Let's consider the diffraction problem. If we're going to have a barrier with a circular aperture of radius a, we make that point the origin, we're going to have a point c here, which is going to be our light source star. I'm going to define that angle there to be alpha. And then out here we're going to have it diffracted. That angle is going to be theta and the angle it is in three dimensions is going to be there. So alpha and theta will lie between 0 and pi by 2, and phi will be between 0 and 2 pi, or minus pi and pi if that's more convenient. So I'm going to write C as capital R times minus cos alpha times minus sine alpha times 0. So I'm taking the x direction like that. We're going to write x primed, which is going to be points defining the aperture, to be 0 rho cos sigma rho sine sigma. These are just polar coordinates 
centered at the origin. And we're going to pose the boundary condition that this is perfectly absorbing. Now we don't need to do that, but if we consider the light ray there, if this wasn't perfectly absorbing, we would get reflected waves here as it, as it comes out. However, what is important is the value of the wavefront at the aperture, and that's not affected by the reflected wave. So it suffices to consider a perfectly absorbing boundary. On this side, psi is equal to zero, and then the diffractive wave comes out in this direction. Okay, I'm going to need mod x prime minus c, that's square root of mod x prime squared, which is rho squared, c squared minus 2 times the dot product, which gives me plus 2 rho r sine alpha equals sigma to 1 half. So that's r into 1 plus 2 rho sine alpha cos sigma over r plus order 1 over r squared to 1 half and that's equal to r plus rho sine alpha cos sigma plus order 1 over r terms. Therefore this point light source psi at x at x prime now is going to be minus e to the i k mod x prime minus c over mod x prime minus c is minus e to the i k r e to the i k rho sine alpha cos sigma over 4 pi r into 1 plus order 1 over r. So that tells me what the wave looks like at the aperture. Next what we need to do is solve for the field psi in this half of the system. So I have a boundary condition along here and as we go out to infinity I had these earlier boundary conditions here. So I'm going to construct a Green's function to solve that problem. Let's, so let's redraw this, have a point x in here. Let me just draw this at some point here. So that's an angle theta from the center of the hole. And so we get cos theta sine theta cos phi sine theta sine phi times some distance r from the hole. I'm going to need mod x minus x prime and that's going to be r squared plus rho squared minus twice the top product. Let's, let's get x primed here, so I want to dot that with that. So I get a 2 rho r sine theta cos sigma cos phi plus sine sigma sine phi all to the one half. And just as before, get the r, get minus rho sine theta, and we've got a trivial identity for that. That's cos sigma minus phi plus order 1 over r. Okay, so g of x and x prime is minus e to the i k mod x minus x prime 
over 4 pi mod x minus x prime. That's the Green's function. Now let x tilde be minus x, y, z if x is x, y, z. So if that point is x, then this point is x tilde. It's the reflection in the boundary. We define the directly Green's function to be g of x and x prime minus g of x tilde and x prime. Then g d of x and x prime is zero on x prime equals zero. That's the first component of x prime and dg by the x prime is 2dg of x and x prime by the x prime on x prime equal to zero. Okay, now let's consider a hemispherical surface enclosing a volume V. And we're going to make this radius very large. It's going to be R0. And so X is going to be contained within this region, but X tilde is not. Then Psi of X is equal to the integral over V of psi of x prime times delta cubed of x minus x prime d3 x prime is the integral over v of psi of x prime times del prime squared plus k squared of g of x and x prime minus g, we get the Dirichlet Green's function, times del prime squared plus k squared psi of x prime d3 x prime, close brackets. So del prime means the gradient with respect to the x prime coordinate. Now of course that term exactly cancels with that and so we just left the integral over v of the divergence of psi of x prime grad g d x x prime minus g of x and x prime gradient Primed, psi of x primed, d3 x primed, which by the divergence theorem is the integral over the boundary of psi x primed dot d s position x prime. So this was our boundary. On this part, the curve part, notice that psi of x primed times the normal, which is just in the radial direction. I'm just considering the ordinary Green's function, not the Dirichlet Green's function at this point. So that's psi 
of x, that's i k minus 1 over mod x minus x prime times g. We had an explicit expression for g. Let's just write it down again. Minus e to the i k mod x minus x primed over 4 pi mod x minus x primed. And minus g. And this is just d by dr. And from our original boundary condition, that gives me that. Well, psi and g are order 1 over r naught on this thing. So this whole thing, that thing cancels with that. So this whole thing is equal to little o of 1 over r naught squared. And the same thing applies if I replace if x goes to x tilde. So therefore, the condition also applies if we replace g by the Dirichlet Green's function. So integrating over this curved surface gives zero in the limit that r0 goes to infinity. So what we have is that psi of x is equal to this integral, and that's minus the integral over the aperture, call the aperture a of psi of x dx prime dy prime dz prime. So I've used the fact that the Green's function vanishes on here, so this condition doesn't give anything. And I've also used that the normal there is equal to minus one zero zero. That explains that minus sign and also that psi is zero outside of the aperture. OK, well, I need to work out this quantity here. D, G, D by the X prime boundary. That's twice D, G by the X prime. That's the Dirichlet Green's function. That one isn't. We know that X minus X prime squared is, if we take the differential of that, that's twice that times d of x minus x prime. But we can also write this out in components, and that gives me, if I'm writing x prime as x prime y prime z prime now, and x as r cos theta, r sine theta, zero. Uh, let me just check that. I think that should be, that's not right. r sine theta, that should be times the cos phi, and that's the sine phi. So this thing is also equal to 2x prime minus r cos theta dx prime plus 2y prime minus r sine theta cos phi dy prime plus 2z prime minus r sine theta sine phi dz prime. In particular then, d mod x minus x prime by the little x prime is going to be equal to add x prime to zero is going to be minus r cos theta over mod x minus x prime. So d g d by d x prime is equal to 
minus 2 dg xx prime mod x minus x prime times r cos theta over this modulus which is we worked that out earlier r squared plus rho squared minus 2 rho r sine theta cos sigma minus phi okay if we write this out in terms of this quantity here where r is now this thing will see this is just going to give me minus 2 i k g x and x prime that comes from differentiating that term this term when you differentiate it you get a 1 over r squared term which is smaller than the term we got from differentiating the numerator here we get in the limit that r becomes very large effectively you just get the cos beta term we have error terms of order 1 over little r so psi of x prime is therefore 2 i k cos theta remember there was a, a minus sign here so let's go with that minus sign times the integral it's going to polar coordinates now 0 to 2 pi for the d sigma integral 0 to a that's the radius psi of x prime g of x and x prime shooting from there and rho to rho and the error terms of order 1 over r now psi had an e to the i k mod x minus c and g had an i k mod x minus x prime so I want to work out what the sum of these two things is And we had those, we worked those out earlier. Plus order r to the minus 1 plus order big r to the minus 1. Well, I can write that as r plus r plus rho times c cos sigma minus sigma naught that's just combining these coses and sines together where c will be the square root of that thing squared and that thing squared so it's going to be the square root of that thing squared we get a sine squared alpha we get minus 2 sine alpha sine theta cos phi at that thing squared which is sine squared times cos squared and that thing gives me a sine squared times sine squared so it's just that thing and sigma naught we could work out in terms of an inverse tan for instance but actually I won't need that formula okay at this point we make a diversion and we want to talk about Bessel functions Bessel's equation is z d by dz, z d by dz of y plus z squared minus n squared y is zero. That coefficient there shows that the Ronskin is proportional to one over z. So there are not going to be two independent solutions which are both analytic at the origin. In fact, if we write y is z to the m times some power series substitute in here this brings down an extra and an m doing it again another one all times z to the m that thing gives me minus z to the m plus higher order terms the z squared terms give me higher order terms 
and that has to vanish, uh, so m has to be plus or minus n. That's the indicial equation. So when n equals 0, you get two roots, which are both 0. So one of them will be nice and regular, and the other one will be a logarithmic term. We know that they couldn't both be regular because of the condition from the Ronsky. OK, well, if we work hard enough, we can show that the solution is given by Jn of z is 1 over 2 pi i to the n minus pi to pi e to the i z cos sigma cos n sigma d sigma. In fact, we will only need n equals 0 and n equals 1, and this holds when n is a non-negative integer. n equals 0, 1, 2, actually. In particular, j 0 to z is 1 over 2 pi integral minus pi to pi e to the i z cos sigma d sigma and j1 is 1 over 2 pi i minus pi to pi e to the i z cos sigma cos sigma d sigma. Now j1 primed is a function of z. is equal to 1 over 2 pi. I bring down an i cos sigma, so the i goes there. Cos squared sigma d sigma. 1 over 2 pi. One minus sine squared sigma. D sigma, or the one that's just J naught of Z. Sine squared, well, if I take sine theta d by d theta of e to the i z cos sigma, actually, that should be sigma, not theta. You can see that if I differentiate that, I bring down a minus sine sigma, extra factor minus sine sigma, an i, which will cancel off that, and a z. So that's j naught of z plus 1 over 2 pi i z sine sigma is the i z cos minus pi to pi, which calls vanishes because the sign vanishes minus 1 over 2 pi i z the integral e to the i z cos sigma times cos sigma d sigma that's differentiating the sign and of course that's j naught of z minus j1 of z over z or if i rearrange this i get z j naught of z is z j1 primed of z plus j1 of z, which is z j1 primed, j1 z or prime, or the integral is going to be the change in that. And that's what we're going to be using in our diffraction problem. So, going back. Psi of x is i k e to the i k r plus r cos theta over i 8 pi squared r r the integral 0 to 2 pi d rho times rho dash is actually d sigma 0 to a e to the i k c rho cos sigma minus sigma naught times rho t rho and we have these error terms 
in here. So that was just substituting for that term. So that was using the result from earlier on and this result here. Okay, well, I know how to do the sigma integral here. I can replace the 0 to 2 pi by any interval of length 2 pi. And so I can effectively get rid of that sigma 0 by doing so. And that then changes this integral into j0. So we get i k e to the i k r plus r cos theta into 4 pi r r, there's a 2 pi in the definition of j naught, which is called j naught k c rho rho to rho naught to a 1 plus what a 1 over this little r, what a 1 over big r. Just rescale the variable rho. Other factor Kc. And that we know from this formula here is just going to be my a e to the i k r plus r cos theta over 4 pi r c j1 k c a times this error term. Now, if we restore the time dependence, psi, that's psi of x e to the minus i k c t. I should have mentioned earlier that the physical quantities are given by taking the real parts of these equations. So the real part of psi is going to be proportional to sine k r plus r minus c t and the modulus of psi squared now you've actually got to add up the contributions from all of the components of the electric field to do this so if you remember earlier on we had an arbitrary vector a you could take that to be each of the canonical basis vectors in turn to get results like this. We take the modulus and square it and we see that the electric field will then be proportional to that thing and we take the time average of sine squared. This which is a half. So the overall intensity which is given by squaring the electric field and taking the time average gives me i is proportional to a squared cos squared theta j1 k c a squared over 16 pi squared r squared little r squared c squared in the limit, well, I suppose it's asymptotically, well, it's actually it's proportional asymptotically, in the limit that r and r are very big. Now, c squared was sine squared alpha minus 2 sine alpha sine theta cos cos phi plus sine squared theta. Well, we're going to be considering the case where 
we have two different light sources. At the moment, I've considered the case where this point lies in the plane which is defined by z equals zero. If I like, I can rotate the whole system around. Alpha doesn't change, but what does change is phi. If I rotate this by angle beta, this changes by an angle beta, so we'll do that. That will allow me to consider two different light sources, not necessarily in the same plane. So we get this formula in that case. Now, the intensity of light is determined by this function here, that's j1 of z over z squared, where z is kca. That's what the intensity is proportional to. On the screen now you'll see a graph of the function j1 of z over z. And you can see there is a maximum at z equals zero, or x equals zero, as I've labelled it on this graph. So that would correspond to c being equal to zero. Let's just rewrite this as sine alpha minus sine theta all squared plus two sine alpha sine theta into one minus cos phi minus beta. So if this thing equals zero, then that thing's greater than to zero and that thing's greater than to zero. So I'll need theta equals alpha and I'll need this term to vanish. So I'd need, so I need phi equals beta. Which is to say that if you have a light, light source down here, the maximum brightness comes from the light ray passing right through the centre of the aperture. And that's to be expected. Now going back to this diagram, you'll see that there's a minimum intensity as well at J1. And J1 is given numerically as 3.831705970207051, so on. So this is the first zero of the Bessel function J1, which is not at the origin. The Rayleigh criterion is satisfied when the maxima of one of the light sources coincides with the minima of the next one. So In other words, we need that KCA is equal to J1 for a minima. So that tells me that if we have theta equals alpha 1, phi equals beta 1 corresponding to a maximum. We want j1 over k a squared is equal to sine alpha 1 minus sine alpha 2 squared plus twice sine alpha 1 sine alpha 2 times 1 minus cos beta 1 minus beta 2. So that's saying that when we have a maxima of one of them, we have a minima of the other. Okay, we're going to assume that alpha 2 is alpha 1 plus delta alpha, beta 2 is beta 1 plus delta beta, and alpha one is small. 
So this condition here gives me j1 squared, k squared, a squared. That's essentially alpha 1 minus alpha 2 all squared, so that's delta alpha squared. We have 2 sine squared alpha. And here we use beta 1 minus beta 2, so that's delta beta all squared over 2 from the power series expansion. So we have that. Now we can recognize that as delta theta squared, square capital theta, because the metric on the unit sphere is the alpha squared plus sine squared alpha d beta squared. So th th there's my unit sphere in polar coordinates and go from one point to another point. That angle, or that length, is going to be the same as that angle. And it's given by that formula there. So what we have is delta theta is JL over KA is going to be 1 over KA is going to be the condition that one of the maxima of the one of the light sources corresponds with the minima of the next, and that's when the ready criteria tells us that we can no longer resolve the two points as separate images. Okay, I said earlier that k was 2 pi over lambda. Let d be 2a be the diameter of the aperture. Then delta big theta is less than j lambda j1 over pi times 2 pi a. So that's lambda j1 over pi d for us not to be able to resolve the images and J1 over pi is 1.21966989. So this is the Rayleigh criterion. If two light sources have an angular separation which is smaller than this quantity here, then you will be unable to resolve the images of those light sources as distinct points. Whereas if the angular separation is larger, then we should be able to resolve them. You might notice that if lambda is decreased, then we can resolve more points. Similarly, if d is increased, we can resolve more points. And that concludes our derivation of the Rayleigh criterion.